so I was a school teacher for, for about seven years, teaching in the arts, teaching kids how to make things. I was able to kind of sneak into the school system and do this despite a bunch of stuff because uh, the arts haven't been, you can't take tests as easily, you, you can't teach to a test and still teach creativity very easily. So um, making. My goal when I was a teacher was to give students as many opportunities and different ways to express themselves as possible because I personally believe that school should be about in, in, like encouraging young people to figure out who they are and what they can do and, where, and, and get the light bulbs to go off in their heads to make, so that they're inspired and can live a life where they're happy. One of the cool things about when I grew up, I'm, I'm 39, so I grew up uh, going in middle school, I, was a, I, I took wood shop, metal shop, and, and uh, home economics, which was awesome because you got to learn how to sew. And none of the, and, and that was great. I, like, you know, I made a, a pillow in the shape of a pig, still have it. <laughs> if you're my age, maybe you have one of these things. Um, about 1990, things started to change. It's probably a little bit earlier than this. I went to, to high school in the, in the 80s, and um, I got to be in an engineering class, and it was right when the point when AutoCAD, we, we had one, ver one computer, and it ran AutoCAD, and we had print shop, and you could print out banners and stuff. It was great. And we had a plotter, and it would go over and grab, which is, for those of you who are, are young, a plotter is a machine that's kind of like a printer, except it goes and grabs a pen and then draws with it. And yeah, you can't stop staring at those things. <laughs> so unfortunately, since then, the arts and making things has just been decimated from our culture. And part of it's probably because education is our lowest priority as a culture. It's probably also because we've focused on, instead of, we've shifted from uh, 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 an industrial country to a country that, well, I'm not sure what it is that we're good at now. Um, but. <laughs> We're going full speed ahead. <laughs> um, one of the things that I learned from teaching was how important it was for young people to be able to use their hands and make things. And so even though my class was art class, it was more like make class. And you, you were going to make a wallet and learn how to sew a button, which nobody at the beginning, you know, I'd literally be like, how many of you know how to sew a button? And my students would be like, crickets. So, and then they'd make a little wallet. And they'd be like, this is my wallet. Check it out. One of the things about making things is you get this rush, and it feels really good. So I really got hooked when I was six. I went to go uh, stay with an uncle whose job was to go out every morning at four in the morning with a small Japanese pickup truck. He knew all the trash routes in Boston, and we would pick up stuff that was good or, um, or, or broken, fix it up during the week, and sell it at uh, flea markets. So I, I hung out with him for like two weeks, and we made a bike. And I think he probably did most of the work, but he made me, he brought, he, like, maybe he had me do things over again. But by the end of the, the time with my Uncle Joe, I had a bike, and I knew if it broke that I could fix it. Um, super empowering, changed my life. Like, the rush that you get when you have something and it's broken and you fix it, it's like, it's not just that you fixed it and you can ride your bike again, but that bike is yours. It is like, in a way, that's, it's not just like you own it, but it is yours because you can fix it if you need to. This kind of idea of being able to make things and feel a sense of pride in your work when you have something physical to show for it is really powerful. When I was in shop class in seventh grade, I made a gumball machine in wood shop, which was a mason jar on top of some pieces of wood, and you had a little lever, and when you moved the lever from one side to the other, it took a gumball and moved it, and it spit it out. And I worked out how many hours it took me to make it, how much the, how much the bill of materials or the bomb was going to be in terms of how much wood costs, the mason jars I was going to get for free by just using spaghetti sauce jars. And I worked it all out, and I didn't actually go into business for myself, but the process of making something meant that I, I figured out what value was in terms of in, in the marketplace. So how do we bring this back into education? Because we've, we're really down a road where testing is, is, number, is key. Schools, school systems, districts are all, are all really under the gun in terms of being able to meet, meet specific criteria. Um, how do we bring making back into it? Um, the good, one of the cool things about the whole STEM education thing, which has been going on for like 10 years, but 
you can't say a sentence about education these days and not mention STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, is that right? Is that we have an entry point for saying like, okay, if we actually want to, you know, uh, as the last speaker mentioned, be in, you know, teach innovation, we, we kind of have to give them some experience around being innovative. So we have to figure out how to do this again. And one of the cool things that I'm, so I was a teacher for a while, then I started making videos for my students about how to make things because I was teaching things five times a day and I noticed if I made a five minute video, it replaced 20 minutes of explanation and they actually listened to it. Um, and then I just started publishing them to the internet in 2003, 2004, and that was a bigger classroom and things transitioned. And then I started, and then I wanted to be able to make anything, so I started a hackerspace so I could have all the tools I wanted in a clubhouse and have all a group of friends who were smarter than me in different ways, so we had expertise to make stuff. The idea is when you have a MakerBot in, and you connect it to students, something happens. One is students see how things are made. Kind of like, you know, when you ask, like, you know, where do eggs come from and kids say, you know, the store, you get to basically, kids, young people, students, and actually adults too, get to, to see this and go, oh, th that's being made right now. So they get some insight into the process of how things work. Um, I could talk about th that part for a long time, but let's see what, so we're getting started. So let me tell you a few stories about MakerBots in classrooms. So we've got, 12,000 MakerBots in the wild right now. We've been going for about three years. There's probably a, a, at least 1,000 of those go, went to, to people with EDU email addresses, or, and then uh, we ship a lot to dorms. So, like, a MakerBot fits on a mini fridge. Um, and we're on a mission to get uh, MakerBots in schools, because we know that if this is just one of the places, frankly, where young people gather. It's one of the few places in the world where, you know, you can go to camps as well, but not all students, not all young people go to camps. But for the mo by law, students have to go out, go to school, um, unless you drop out. I dropped out of seventh grade. It was awesome. <laughs> I recommend it for every student, actually. Uh, but anyway, moving back to w uh, uh, an actual plan, Right now, we've got uh, 25 schools where we have MakerBots in the schools, and they are, uh, test we have curriculum. Uh, if Liz Arm is in the audience right there. She developed it all. She's a teacher here in Brooklyn, and she's, well, and she's coordinated it all. We've got teachers testing that curriculum, breaking it, fixing it, and sharing it back so that we've got a community of teachers participating, and actually, and you all are invited to participate and get a MakerBot and have it in your classroom, use the curriculum, improve it or develop new curriculum that fits your, uh, what, what you want to do and share it back to, to make the world a better place, really. Here's one story, this is Dara Ross, and she's at the Brooklyn International School. She teaches uh, uh, students who are learning English as a foreign language and she's teaching Hamlet. And you can see on the computer, her students are doing, as, as part of the, the curriculum in studying Hamlet, they're studying Danish architecture from the time of Hamlet in the story. So they're looking at a picture of a, a Danish castle, and then they're using a, a tool called uh, Tinkercad, which is an in-browser uh, CAD tool. So, and it's actually really easy. So you can just go to tinkercad.com, pull it up, start making rectangles and and cubes and add cones and next thing you know you're going to have a castle. And then this is our, our previous version of MakerBot Thingomatic and you can see there it is. There's the student work printed out. I love the stickers on this machine. Um, <laughs> customized by students. So the idea of being able to take something that's really re like, ab you know, foreign, not only is it Shakespeare in Old English, but it's Hamlet, so it's all stuff about, you know, so there's stuff about Denmark, and then make that physical to, to, to build a connection and to build real knowledge about what can happen. I just put this up here because like real curriculum is real curriculum, and when you see like this is what is behind there, uh, and you can see that not only is there like here's what we're going to do, but there's um, the core standards so that you can 
you know, one of the things we focus on on curriculum at MakerBot is making it so that when you use it, you, cannot, you can justify it to your, your parents, to your administrators, to your principal, and say, you know what, by, use it, by doing this, what turns out to be really fun, personal manufacturing stuff in the classroom, you can actually still meet the requirements of the school system. So you should check it out. Educators in the room should go to curriculum.makerbot.com. Come see us afterwards if you don't write that down now. It's a, it's really, it makes me really happy. <laughs> so if you're going to have a MakerBot in the classroom, here's some things that will just make your life better. It works best when it's embraced by your administrator because you want to be able to have a ba backup when parents come in and, say, and they're like, my kid is having fun in school. You want the administrator to be like, yes, and we're meeting academic standards 5.1, 5.4, 5.6, and it's awesome. You want to kind of prep them for that. It works best when the teachers actually own the machines. I can't tell you how many machines and equipment is in schools that's not used because the teacher can't mess with it. Um, and, you know, being able to fail until your idea works. This is something, uh, this is probably the thing we do best as a culture is fail. Uh, not every culture in the world has this, and many cultures failing reflects on your family, your friends, your social standing, and it's just unacceptable to fail. And so in terms of being able to take risks, if you live in that kind of a, a space, you can't take risks. For whatever reason, in our culture, I'm not sure why, but we're capable of doing really stupid things and seeing if they work. And so um, this is, it turns out, the core of innovation. The core of invention is the ability to iterate. And this is an innovation machine in that way because you can make something and then if it's not right, if the spires on your castle aren't tall enough, you just edit it and remake it. And you can iterate really quickly right in front of you. And there's no like, you know, send it off to some place, wait three weeks, oh, it's not right, well, we don't have time, move on, forget it. It's just like, okay. This isn't, you know, this isn't exactly what I wanted. We're going to fix it and do it again. And there just aren't that many ways in life that you get to experience, you get to where you get to embrace just totally taking risks and trying things out, and then being able to iterate until you're satisfied. That sort of that the the failing part really is only exciting when you can do it, when you can fail again and fail again until you're until you get to a place where either you've achieved perfection, or you can just live with it. So we, we also collaborate with the mouse program. Does anybody know what the mouse program is? OK, awesome. Um, for those of you who don't, the mouse program is a program that trains students to be IT professionals. And they end up being the, the, the people in the school who fix everything. Awesome program. Um, we, they actually had a competition among their program, and they got 15 different schools got to, come, got to send a, a group of students to come and make MakerBots at MakerBot and go back. And these are the wizards in school. So we're kind of, this is one way that we're finding a way into schools by finding the, uh, finding the hardcore geeks and, and super, super clever kids who are you know, making things work in schools and putting them in their hands. They learned how to do CAD. We trained them up. They're, they're the, in some ways, get to be ambassadors for the rest of the school. Do, has James already talked, or is he coming up next? He's coming up soon. On the left-hand side, he's got an Egyptian unit that he did, and his students created things to connect to that unit. The, oh, they made toothbrushes of the future. Like, I'm not sure I want to stick any of these in my mouth, <laughs> but I love that they're thinking about, OK, if we decide to just not have this uh, toothbrush in the same way, and we bust out of the way that we thought about toothbrushes forever, and we think about different shapes, what happens then? Like, oh, that gets me excited. Um, in San Antonio, I love this. They were like, we need, this is like the new bake sale. They created a chess set that, like, they had, like, the Alamo Rook. So they took local, um, local geography and local architecture, created their own chess set, manufactured it on their MakerBot, sold each set for 150 bucks, made, raised a bunch of money for their school. Like, in that way, a MakerBot can pay for itself. They also did like, stuff around plant cells and making models. Yeah, when you can see things physically, it really it changes the way you think about things. Instead of, it takes things out of the theoretical and puts them into the, into the real. 
We're doing a, a bunch of outreach with NYU Poly, where we give engineering graduate students maker bots. They connect to local teachers and do cool stuff. This is one thing that um, Brian did. He had this idea. He just made this up. He was like, you know what? I want to teach how if we put gardens on top of houses, how that affects water runoff. And so he just modeled up some houses that look like the, the houses in his neighborhood and then turn them into, into planters, and then they do an activity where they measure how much water actually goes through and you know, grow things to kind of show the whole experience on a, on, a, on, a, on a small level to show big concepts. The cool thing about this is when you have a MakerBot, you have a superpower. You can make anything you need. And we're just at the beginning. I'm really curious to see what teachers do with this in the next two, five, ten years. When they have a tool where they can just imagine something, where they can imagine curriculum, they can imagine a way to show students something new, and then they can just make it, or even better, they can have their students make it and see how it works. So making learning empower. Oh, there's, there's, even though if you, if you take me out for drinks, I'll be bitter about the education system. I'm pretty excited about what's happening in the learning space as the internet is hitting more and more education stuff, where we all are sharing what we know so that we can all benefit. I'm thrilled that teachers are getting this and, and finding ways to empower their students to own the, the actual, to take it from knowledge and take it into, into things. We're just at the beginning. We're starting a foundation this fall. We're actually looking for a director and a coordinator, so I was hoping that you might be in the audience and available. So I put. So this is how I'm ending. Um, we're gonna we're gonna find a way to put MakerBots in schools and infiltrate the educational system and make it so students can make things and feel that pride of you no know, of of not just knowledge but knowledge making and then empowerment to to take it even farther. Thank you.